Understanding God's Celestial Clock. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. Right now we are nearing the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, approaching the eighth day, an incredible time, so much going on right now. There's a lot of geopolitical events going on in the news that also reinforce what scripture tells us about the time, a time when we should be watching and expecting for him. In our last video we talked about there's been a flurry of calls for peace and safety all of a sudden, which reminds us of the scripture warning that sudden destruction is coming next. And we also see recently with the earthquake in Indonesia, a lot of sober reminders now that an even greater sudden destruction is on the threshold. One of our brothers in Christ from that region, he asked specifically for prayer, so let's keep this area in prayer, especially for the brethren during this time. Sudden destruction is coming, but the Lord is working in hearts even now. We've also certainly seen an uptick in earthquakes. A lot of major earthquakes happening all of a sudden recently. Again, reminding us of the birthing pangs that will lead up to the tribulation. How they're going to increase in intensity. We have so many warnings that sun destruction is coming. Let's definitely keep this particular region in prayer. But let's also be watchful and mindful that greater events are on the near horizon as well. And this picture right here is from the main hospital over there. And they have other hospitals that have been impacted as well. You know, one of our ministry outreaches, DisasterCrashCourse.com, one of the main focuses we have is medical missions in a disaster situation. So this is a good reminder time for us to download resources that can be of use in the days ahead. Again, DisasterCrashCourse.com, we have three main booklets, different PDFs that you can download, print out. Make sure you have a printed version so it's ready to go. Also share it with friends and family. There's a lot of people using it even now today, but definitely we see so many reminders that it will be very needful in the days ahead as well. Right now we are nearing the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. So many important pictures going on that deal primarily with the time, the season, the pictures, the shadows, and the patterns of first fruits. That's what the entire Feast of Tabernacles is revolving around the first fruits. It's a time when the people would rejoice at what they've brought in from the harvest. And that's why it's also referred to as the Feast of Ingathering. The appointed time of the feast is supposed to go with the appointed season agriculturally. They go together because the one event celebrates what is happening in the real world. Now recently one of our commenters, who incidentally is the same brother from Indonesia, again keep him in prayer, a printed resource was requested particularly over what we just covered in the last video. How do we understand God's celestial clock? How do we understand the times? And what are the biblical guidelines given to us so we can know the time, so we can have the appointed times in their proper season? Praise the Lord, that spurred a lot of research and compiling together a lot of information. The Lord has given strength and wisdom and liberty for it all. Thank you for your prayers. You can find a link for this new resource in the description box. Understanding God's Celestial Clock for Days, Months, Years, and Appointed Times. And the more you study it, the more you see that these all go together. God told us on the very first page of the Bible what He has given us so we can know time. Not just time, but also the seasons and the appointed times that go with those seasons. We don't need to look to any other book. The Bible tells us on the very first page what we are to use to determine time, particularly for the appointed times that he also gives us. But if you have done any researching on the subject, you know certainly that there's many different calendars that are put out there that pose themselves to be God's celestial clock and how to read it. So how do you know which one is the right one to be using? Well, obviously it's going to be the ones that use what God has given to us. And then from there we go into how do you read what God has given to us. And it is foremost for us to remember that God wants us to know the time. And he even emphasizes that throughout scripture. He wants us to know the time, which means he is going to give us guidelines in scripture, in the Bible, of what he wants us to use to determine and quality control check our understanding of time. There's different ways that people try to read a clock, but only one is correct. And the correct way is going to line up with God's standard for accuracy. And so we start off with an overview of just different things that we need to consider when we look at any calendar. And I've studied a number of them. What do we use to determine the right calendar? Well, we put it up against God's word and we study against the ruler that he has given us, the guidelines that he has given us. Are we using what he has given us to determine time? Are we using his quality control checks? And are we confirming the accuracy that the calendar works in the real world? The calendar God gave us was meant to bring us to the appointed times on time. And if the calendar we're using doesn't do that, then we're reading the clock wrong or we got a wrong clock. So we use God's guidelines and God's accuracy checks that he gives us and that helps us determine which one is correct. And to understand the correct time, we also have to understand God's celestial clock, the physical lights and the firmament that he's given us and what each part is used for. 
And once we understand those roles, then we'll understand what they're doing, and we'll also understand how to read the clock because we'll understand the roles that each part is doing and how they all work together. That's a key point. A lot of times these are going to be working together. God's celestial clock is a loony solar calendar that uses both two great lights in the firmament. They work together. And we give an overview of how the Bible talks about where these are and the functions of the celestial heavens. They do declare the glory of God. And when we view the heavens the way the Bible tells us to, then we'll have wisdom about the time. The Bible tells us what makes a day, an evening, and a morning. And in that sequence, because that follows and models the creation sequence. And then we also present throughout this book different examples that go with the precedence that Scripture gives us, too. For example, we know for sure that the day starts at sunset. For example, the great man of God, Nehemiah, he always ordered the city gates to be closed right before sunset because he knew the Sabbath was about to start. The Bible will give us the guidelines. The Bible will give us precedent. And then we'll also see in Scripture examples of that being used that proper way consistently. And that's what we need to look at, and that further helps us understand the time. We look at what God gives us, and then we should be able to see that pattern throughout Scripture if we're reading it correctly, and we're reading God's Word correctly, too. We talk about the week. A week is just seven days put together. So you got to know what the days are first before you can understand what a week is properly, too, as well. It's a day seven, seven times. And we also talk about the season. A lot of people think of the seasons as just the appointed times, such as the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and all that. It is that, but it is more than that. The seasons are the literal seasons. The time for barley, the time for wheat, the time for grapes, their planting season. There are different seasons. They're also appointed. They're not going to change. The seed time and harvest, the cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. The particular agricultural and meteorological seasons are also appointed. And that's what we have to keep in mind. There are two type of seasons. There are two type of appointed times. And when we understand that, there are appointed times for man to keep, and there are appointed times that the earth keeps with the agricultural cycles. And this is key to understanding the guidelines that God gives us in Scripture where we are to keep the ordinances, the appointed times, such as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in his season, in the season that goes with the unleavened bread. Man's appointments should line up with Earth's appointments as well. They are all appointed times. And on page 10 we have an overview of the appointed times that God gave for man to keep. And these are the ones we're familiar with. Passover, Shavuot, Day of Trumpets, Atonement, Tabernacles, etc. Those are the appointed times that were given to man to keep. And he was also told with different requirements that they are to line up with the seasons that the earth is going to be keeping. They must go together. They must match. And this is the greatest way for you to understand if you're using the celestial clock right or if you're reading it right is does it bring you to those seasons? Will these two seasons, the appointed times, line up with the appointed times? They are required to meet up. And particularly for the three ones where people were expected to show up in Jerusalem, there are also specific guidelines as well. These are called appointed times for man for a reason. They were required to be there. It was a required attendance, which means you need to be reading the clock right or you're going to be late. And God definitely emphasized, do not be late, but also do not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits. Do not delay. These should match up exactly. Not a month later, not a month earlier. They must meet up at the same time, so you're showing up on time, and you will not be empty-handed. You will have the first fruits in hand. We talk about the month. What is a month? What determines the start of the month? And again, you will best understand a month when you understand what the day is. We cover some of the guidelines that relate to the land of Israel because many of the appointed times were done from the perspective and they were going to be done when the children of Israel came into the land of Israel. And that is one thing we always have to keep in mind with the appointed times. Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, all that. It's all related to what is going on in the land of Israel because that is what the timing is pegged to, the agricultural cycles in Israel. Then we talk in depth about the years and how both of the lights in the heaven, the moon and the sun, both are used together to determine the years. And when we understand their roles, we'll more clearly understand what has precedent to declare the start of the year, what has precedent to declare the first month. With the priority being, you must keep the appointed times in their seasons. So there is going to be fluctuation. 
Some years you will have to speed up, some years you will have to slow down so you can keep everything in sync with the agricultural appointed times. And incidentally, this is the major reason why fixed calendars such as the Enoch calendar will not work in the real world because they are fixed. They cannot fluctuate to the seasons, to the appointed agricultural seasons. For example, with the Enoch calendar, most of the time you're not going to be able to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread right when the first roots are ready. A major fail there. With God's calendar and with God's appointed times for man to keep, he emphasized keep these in their season. Keep them in their season. He doesn't say keep them lined up with the equinox. He says keep them lined up with the seasons. The barley first fruit should be at the barley season. The wheat first fruit should be at the wheat season. And the grape first fruit should be at the feast of ingathering. The feast of the Lord, even the holy convocation, should be proclaimed, announced, declared in their season. This is the highest priority with the appointed times. And this is a major way you'll be able to find out if your calendar that you're following is correct or not. Are the different first fruit feasts held when those first fruits are coming up? It's going to be a big clue. We talk about and compare different ways of quality control, different rules of thumb that help keep the year and the months very close to the appointed season and even with the fluctuations, different quality controls, different case studies of the different years back to 2011 that have followed this rule of thumb, primary precedent from scripture with its guidelines, and then even secondary historical precedents that back it up, always remembering what God in his word tells us to line the years up with. He doesn't tell us to line it up with the equinoxes. He tells us to line it up with the season. When we look in God's Word and we could put pencil and paper to what His guidelines are, then we can know for sure what the time is. There are a lot of man-made guidelines out there on the internet, but no, that's not what we go by. We go by Scripture. What does Scripture tell us to line the first month up with? Does He tell us to line it up with the spring equinox? No. Does He tell us Passover has to be lined up with a certain time? No. He tells us the first fruit feast must be lined up at their season. That's the primary emphasis of the appointed times. Throughout the entire calendar, make sure all of these line up with the season, the right earthly season. That is the top priority with correct calendaring of God's calendar. Make sure that the calendar appointments line up with the right earthly season. We talk about the role of a 13th month, a leap month, so you can keep the appointed times in sync using both the moon and the sun working together so that man's appointed time can be proclaimed and declared in the proper earthly season as well. And we also show examples in the scripture referencing the intercalated months as well. And of course we go in depth into the important role of barley because barley is going to be the very first first fruit appointed time that has to be lined up with. So that's what God emphasizes. Keep this ordinance, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is what he's talking about, in his season. So you have to understand how barley works in the land of Israel so you will know what the season for the first fruits of barley are. And best to understand that, we need to understand the life cycle of barley. When are the first fruits ready? Not the last fruits, not the last of the harvest, not the part of barley that comes right later. No, when are the first fruits, the very, very first of all the crops, when is that going to be ready? What are you looking for? Because this is one of the major requirements that God gives with the appointed time, particularly the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He emphasizes twice in Scripture, do not appear before me empty. You must have the barley first fruits at the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It must be ready within the first month. And that's where some people make a mistake. The entire month is referred to as a bib. It's not telling us to look for the first fruits before the first month or at the beginning of the first month. He says, no, make sure the Feast of Unleavened Bread is at that time. The month of a bib is called a month of a bib because that's when in that month it should be ready. And that's what it needs to line up with the first fruits of barley. And so for the farmers and priests over there in Israel, as they were observing the barley, how it was growing, how it's progressing, they'd have a very good idea ahead of time. Will this be ready in time for the Feast of Unleavened Bread if we don't add a leap month? If it's not, then maybe we do need to add a leap month. And there are some times when they would, sometimes when they wouldn't. But they'd have a very good idea based on barley's pretty consistent growth cycle. Will it be ready toward the middle of the month when we need to make this first fruits offering and we need to have it in hand. And that knowledge would affect would they proclaim that appointed time in its season. Understanding the season. So it's in the right season. And this was not a light decision at all. Because the priests knew this was an appointed time. Which meant all the males were going to be in Jerusalem. Away from their farms. For over a week. Which means you have to have the timing so the first fruits can be gathered and offered. And all the farmers can go back home after that almost two week vacation. 
and still have time to harvest their crop before it falls on the ground. There's a lot of considerations and a small window every single year in the harvest cycle of when it's a perfectly good time to be offering this, and there's also times when it's not. Reading the clock wrong had significant impact upon the farmers and the entire nation of Israel. That's why it was so very important that they get it right, too. Because if they timed it wrong, the farmers were going to lose a lot of their crop, a crop which they heavily depended on. So it's very important to understand these life cycles and why it's so important to declare it at the right time, to proclaim Feast of Unleavened Bread in his season, which means you need to be watching the season and observing it. And this is why the Enoch calendar does not work, because it's a fixed calendar that does not move. It also does not use scripture as its basis. It uses another book. The Bible tells us what the guidelines are that God wants us to follow. And that's what we go by. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible tells us how we can keep God's appointed time. That's also what the Bible is going to be repeating as well, what it has said in multiple places, the instructions that it gives. Our instructions for understanding God's time will be in the Bible, in Scripture. And when we compare, for example, the Enoch calendar with the guidelines that God gives about keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread in his season, we will see that the Enoch calendar just over the past six years had a 50% failure rate. 50% of the time, it was over two weeks late. That's very significant, especially the more that you study barley and see how important it is. If you time things wrong, you are going to lose sometimes your entire barley crop, particularly if all your farmers are away for almost two weeks in Jerusalem. It's very important that the very, very, very first of the barley crop is timed so that it is at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so that they have time to come back and harvest their barley with also the understanding they were not allowed to harvest their barley until the barley first fruits were offered at the appointed time that God gave. So all this plays together. This isn't just paper talk or armchair debates that happen on the internet. This affected their everyday life, their livelihood, and even the condition of things that affected the entire nation. It was critical to follow God's guidelines that he gave them. And when we compare calendars with scripture, such as the Enoch calendar, we find that it does not match the biblical requirements. It fails. It completely and catastrophically fails. We go with what scripture tells us. In understanding why the emphasis is on first fruits, you start to see the pictures and patterns. Why is God emphasizing the first fruits in each of these appointed times? All three of the appointed times are all about the first fruits. And if you don't have a calendar that focuses on the first fruits and the proper timing, you are not going to experience the depth of the shadows and pictures that scripture has and why he wants us to be having those and examining those at those times because they go together. And you will miss some important pictures. On page 28, we have a list of different further resources, different calendars that we recommend just for reference, some other sites relating to astronomy and also agricultural reports from over there in Israel, and a few frequently asked questions, particularly... Does the Bible talk about spring feasts and how they have to be after the spring equinox? No. The term spring feast, that's a man-made nickname. It's not in scripture. Same thing for fall feasts. That's just a nickname that man made up. And so if you go by nicknames, you're going to start looking for requirements for those nicknames and making up requirements. And that's just going to make you confused. No, we don't look at nicknames. We don't look at things man made up. We look at God's guidelines. And it's also interesting to note, the more you understand the celestial clock, how it actually works, you realize that those man-made nicknames and requirements don't even work sometimes. There are times when you can have seven lunar new moon sightings after the vernal equinox, but even before the fall equinox, which means the seventh new moon would be visible before the fall equinox. But again, those are man-made requirements. But once you understand how God's celestial clock works, you realize those aren't requirements he gives, and there are times they wouldn't work anyway. We look at what does scripture tell us. On page 30, we show month one and the different considerations that went into determining is this the proper time to proclaim the appointed times in their season. Some of the agriculture reports that went into it and showed that, yes, barley was ready. The first fruits were ready within the first month. And we know that meets God's guidelines that he gave. So we know the first month was declared and proclaimed biblically. And all of God's requirements for the first appointed time, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, those could have been met by those over there in Israel. So we know the time is correct because it works in the real world. 
Of course, if you know month one, you'll automatically know when month seven is going to be too as well. And so on page 31, we have the current month where we are right now. And this is why we are observing the Feast of Ingathering, which also relates to first fruits at this time as well. So definitely download this booklet, print it out, Understanding God's Celestial Clock, a link in the description box, share it with others. Let's look at what scripture tells us to look at. And let's look at the guidelines that it gives us so we know we're following the right calendar, not just wandering off in the wrong direction. Because the emphasis is always going to be on first fruits. That's an important picture and shadow pattern that he emphasizes because he wants us to keep that on our mind, particularly at those appointed times. And in God's word, in scripture, in the Bible, he tells us exactly when these should be held too. Verse 16, In the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Multiple times he tells the people, this is when this is going to be held. You have the Feast of End Gathering when you have finished gathering in your labors out of the field. As soon as you're done bringing it all in, that's when you should be celebrating the first fruits of what you brought in. God is very particular about letting us know this should be held at this time so none appear before me empty. He also has similar requirements for Shavuot, Pentecost. Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. Just so you know, when you're supposed to be starting to count, this is when you start. And you will be able to start correctly if you have proclaimed the appointed time in his season. The celestial clock, God's time, the appointed times, those were not just some intellectual discussions that the people held. This was something that impacted them in their daily life. They understood what were the first fruits. They went out, they harvested it. They were fully aware of the cycles of how their creator gave them what they were thanking him for with these first fruits. It was a literal, physical, tangible picture lesson that was also a shadow and pattern for future things as well. This was meant to be real. It was supposed to connect with what they were observing at the temple with what they were holding in their hand, physically. It was a real picture that they were supposed to experience. And this is why he emphasized, do not appear before me empty, empty-handed. You need to have this picture tangibly in your hand when you show up to these appointed times that I give you. And it should match the earthly appointed times for those seasons, too. Don't appear before me empty. I want you to have this picture in your hand so you can make this connection. Observe the first fruits. Observe how they are getting ready for a particular time. The first fruits need to be ready in their appointed times. Everything needs to be proclaimed in their season. They all need to go together. And this is what they had to give particular attention to. These pictures were so very important. God wanted them to see and experience this picture at these particular times. And if your calendar does not line up with the appointed times and you show up empty-handed, you're going to miss so many incredible and valuable pictures that God fulfilled in prophecy and it still has yet to fulfill too. You're going to miss the whole emphasis of first fruits when you don't have that tangible picture and can make that connection of, aha, this is what Christ did. 1 Corinthians 15:19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. The apostles were fully aware of the pictures and patterns and shadows that Christ was fulfilling when he came. The prophetic pictures. Having the appointed times in their proper seasons help make this connection and help make it real of what Christ was doing when he came with an understanding that prophetically in the future, a first fruits pattern is also going to be repeated as well. So if you want to have the best understanding of the rapture and our gathering unto our Lord, you need to understand the emphasis on first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ, that is coming. We will miss so many powerful pictures and understanding of Scripture if we don't focus on the guidelines that God gives us about how we understand the time. It's all about the first fruits in their proper season. None shall appear before me empty. A repeated emphasis with all three major appointed times. And particularly now we're at the Feast of In Gathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. That's when the Feast of In Gathering is going to be. Right after you finish gathering everything in. Right when you have finished gathering everything in, that's when you're going to offer the first fruits. Deuteronomy 16, 13. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. 
relating to the tabernacles, they shall not appear before the Lord empty. This is extremely important, and God even rewords it slightly so they clearly understand what he's talking about when they're supposed to do this. You are going to observe the Feast of Tabernacles after you have gathered in your corn and your wine, after you've brought in the grape harvest. If there is any confusion about when you're supposed to be doing this, right after you bring in your wine, right after you bring in your grape harvest, that's when you're supposed to be observing the Feast of Tabernacles. Not a month later, right after you have brought it in. That's when you're going to do it. Because I don't want you to appear before the Lord empty. You must have the first fruits of what you've just gathered in right at the end of bringing in your grape harvest. Because that's when you're going to have the Feast of Tabernacles. Exodus 22, 29. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits and of thy liquors. Feast of Tabernacles is when the grape harvest is brought in, when the first of the wine is brought in. And he emphasizes repeatedly, scripture repeatedly emphasizes the guidelines that it tells us, the instructions and righteousness that it gives. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits. Don't delay it. Don't say, well, we've done gathered in the grape harvest, let's delay it a month now and let's just wait. No. He says, do not delay. When you have done gathered it in, that's when you should be having the Feast of Tabernacles. There should be no delay. No delay. That's when you're going to bring in the first fruits of your grape harvest, of your wine, of your liquors. The timing is extremely important. After that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine, that's when you are going to observe the Feast of Tabernacles without delay. So that brings up the question, what is the agricultural cycle? Well, let's go to a winery over there in the Golan Heights. Have they finished their in gathering for the year? Well, they started on July 31st. That's when they started their harvesting and started making wine and crushing it. And they would post updates throughout the weeks ahead. August 5th, they were still harvesting. August 12th, they were still harvesting. September 2nd, they were still harvesting. And you'll remember from our tour last year, they said it was going to take them several weeks to bring in, to gather in all the grapes. The wine aging and all that, that would take several months beyond that. But the actual gathering process would take several weeks. And they started on July 31st, and they're still going through September. But by September 25th, they were pretty much done the grape harvest. They had gathered it in a number of weeks after they started the harvest. And here they are wishing everyone a happy Sukkot, which fittingly from Scripture is the time observed when they had finished bringing in the wine, when they had brought in the first of their liquors. They were done bringing in the corn and the wine. The vintage was brought in. Now is the seasonal time for the Feast of Tabernacles for Sukkot. We are at the proper time. This is a time to observe these pictures and patterns that go with the first fruits that are brought in at this time without delay. Again, Scripture tells us the guidelines. This is when you should do this. Do not delay this. Do not be empty-handed. The focus, the primary focus of proclaiming the calendar time in the appropriate time is making sure that they're in the proper seasons. God's guidelines given in Scripture, seen in the real world and working in the real world, that's how we can know we're at the right time right now. All the major appointed times deal with first fruits. But prophetically, we've been called first fruits, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So now's the time. This feast is called the Feast of Ingathering. So now's a good time for us to examine our life. What first fruits are we bringing forth in our life? What's going to be seen in our life when we appear before the Lord? He is the vine. We are the branches. He wants us to bring forth much fruit. Are we bringing forth the fruit that he wants to see in our life? This is a big question we need to be asking at this time, particularly the more we understand what the first fruits are and how important they are at a particular season and time where we are right now, with a huge emphasis, don't appear before me empty. Do not delay bringing forth the first fruits. What are we bringing forth in our life? Is it the fruit of the Spirit? Is this what we are striving to bring forth in our lives so that the world can see Christ in us and bring glory to our Father? There is an expectation of harvest, but even more so, there is an expectation of first fruits. What is being made ready in our life right now? Are we making ourselves ready? We are specifically told we are as first fruits. Are we making ourselves ready for the in gathering unto our Lord? Now is that the high time that exudes all these pictures, brings it together at this season. A time that was so well on the Hebrew mind that this was a time of in gathering. This was a time of celebrating and rejoicing in what the Lord had brought in. That's what's on the minds right now at this season. Do we know what season it is? Do we know what time it is? Are we living accordingly so that we won't be found empty handed? Are we running for the prize so we can finish strong, so we can finish with fruit brought forth in our life that will honor and glorify our Father? Is that what we're bringing forth? Is that what we're striving for? Is that what we're pushing for? Are we running for the prize? We're in the latter part of the Feast of Ingathering. 
a time that focuses on the first fruits, a time of gathering, what is being presented, what is being offered. There's also the beautiful pictures of when Christ was revealed during the midst of this very feast, a feast of end gathering, with the expectation that he's coming to gather us. There are so many pictures and patterns that are rehearsed at this time that remind us of his promises as well. Definitely check out the timeline. We update it almost every single day. You can find a link in the description box. But also in the new resource, we have month 7 also outlined as well in the convenient calendar. Definitely download the booklet, Understanding God's Celestial Clock, print it out, and share it with others. We have heard so many trumpet calls, so many things telling us the time, so we can know the time. We know it's the season. We know the pictures are here even for a gathering. We know our bridegroom cometh. That's the whole call of all the trumpet calls, all the signals saying, Your bridegroom cometh. What do you do? You don't delay, you go out to meet them. So this is what we need to do. Let's rise up. Let's trim our lamps. Let's shine bright. Let's bring forth the first fruits that he wants to see shining in our life. Now bring glory to our Father. And let's go out to meet our bridegroom, our beloved, our redeemer. And let's love him and let's serve him. First and highest above all else. Maranatha. <laughs>